Hey guys, thanks for joining me for an episode of Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Flashpoint. This is a game by Indie Board and Cards. It is a two to six player game that takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play, and is a cooperative game, so all the players are working together as a team to either win or lose as a team. In the game itself, each player is taking on the role of a firefighter within this team, and they're called out to a burning building where they're trying to rescue all the survivors they can before the building collapses and make it out of there alive. They're going to do this by spending actions that they will have during their turn to extinguish fires, put out smoke, kick down doors, open up wallways, carry out unconscious survivors, all kinds of different things that they can do. So my opinions of this game so far are very good. I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, it's a great game to introduce new players as there's two different modes to it. You have a family mode that kind of simplifies a lot of the rules and just takes the, the bare necessities out of it. So if you're playing with a lot of players that aren't familiar with games in general and you're trying to introduce them to something new, this is a great game for that. It's very easy and there's not a lot of complicated rules to mix players up, especially in the family mode. If you're playing as a with a gaming group that you want a little bit more depth to it, then there's the advanced mode that will include specialists for your team. So you guys will be able to pick different specialists that have their own particular actions or strengths that they can use to help the team out. There's also all kinds of different things that the fires will do between having flare-ups and all kinds of different things that will make the fire even more erratic than it already is. And then you, there's also inclusion of the fire... Um, the fire truck and all kinds of different things uh, to just add more depth to the game. And then if you enjoy it, there's also a bunch of expansions they've done, they've done with this game where you can have multi-leveled buildings, uh, inclusion of fire dogs, all kinds of different aspects to really uh, expand the game into all kinds of different areas that you're interested in. So I definitely recommend checking it out, especially if you're looking for an entry-level game or just a game that, that, that you can just have a lot of fun with. The only drawback that I've seen with this one so far is that it is a little bit dice dependent as far as how the fire works because you'll roll two uh, dice each turn or each player turn to determine where the fire goes and if you roll bad or you have a couple of really bad rolls consistently uh, that fire can really get out of hand really quick and start breaking down walls and if you ever run out of the little uh, ball um, cubes then the building is going to collapse and the game is over. And I have had a couple games where we've just had terrible rolls and that happens very quickly. But other than that, like I said, it's a lot of fun. I definitely would highly recommend checking this one out. So let's go ahead and head to the table and I'll teach you guys how to play. So let's go ahead and start with setup. So the first thing you're going to do is choose the side of the board you want to play on. There are two sides to this board and each side has a different building setup in it. From here, let's go ahead and take a look at a breakdown of the board. So the board is broken into a grid that refers to the set of dice you're going to be using. On the left and right side are going to be the sides for the red dice and are going to be numbered 1 through 6. And the top and bottom are going to be numbered 1 through 8 for the black 8-sided dice. As you roll these dice, you're going to get a set of coordinates. They're going to refer to a spot on the board. So for example, with this 4-2, we have the 4 and the number two section over here, which is going to coordinate with this space here and is going to be labeled as such on the bottom of that space. Each space is going to have that label so that you can find that nice and easily with the dice. From here then, the building has the white walls, which are impassable unless you, can, unless you destroy them, which you'll do by placing black cubes on them. Once two black cubes are on a space, then you can pass through that space as if there was no wall there as the wall has been destroyed. Then we also have these little circle icons, which are open doors for the four outer doors. And the inner doors will have door tokens placed on them. But if they get destroyed by fire and removed, then the two black cubes are basically a representation of the black cubes that you will be placing on the walls. You will not place those on the doorways. Those are simply there just to remind you that those are passable once the door has been removed and destroyed. So let's go ahead and start. We're going to go ahead and use this side and we're going to go ahead and place closed doors on all of those spaces within the building. From here, then you're going to go ahead and choose the difficulty of the game. And as you guys can see, there are three different difficulties, recruit, veteran, and heroic. And for this setup, we're going to be going through the advanced setup. So there is a family friendly, easy setup, which is found at the beginning of the rule book. So we're going to go ahead and set up for recruit, which is three ignitional explosions and three hazmats. 
So from here, then we're going to go ahead and start with the first explosion. So we're going to refer to this chart and roll the eight sided dice. So we have a seven, which refers to the four, four grid. So we have the four and four, which is going to put us here. So we're going to place our first fire there and a hotspot token. And then we're going to resolve the explosion. So an explosion goes out in all four directions, which I'm going to cover a little bit more later. But let's go ahead and start with the basics. So we'll place fire in each section that is adjacent to that initial section. If it reaches a wall, then we would place a black cube. Or if it reaches a closed door, the door is going to be removed and destroyed. So now that we've resolved the first explosion, we're ready to move on to the second one. So with the second one, we're going to go ahead and roll both dice, which is a 4-5, which is going to be down here. So again, we're going to resolve the explosion by placing a fire and a flare up. And then we're going to place a fire in each adjacent space. Now, since these two spaces are adjacent and this one's already on fire, it's going to cause a uh, shock wave and so it's going to continue along the fire path until it reaches an obstacle or a open space so since we hit a wall we're going to place a black cube there as it has started to destroy that wall and then the the third and final explosion we have to resolve we're going to flip over the black die so it is an eight five so again we will place a fire there a flare up and resolve the explosion so unfortunately that is a small room so all three walls are going to take damage and we will place one more fire token down here now during this if you happen to roll a space that is already on fire you would simply roll for a new hot spot and then we're ready to move on to the next section so we're going to roll and place hazmat markers so we have three of those for this setup so we have a five five which is a fire sp spot, so we're going to have to roll again. 3-6. Our second one is a 4-3, which is already on fire, so we have to re-roll that. 8-5, which is on fire. 7-4. And our last one is a 6-2. Okay, then we're going to resolve our PO, uh, point of interest markers. So we're going to go ahead and remove one blank and two of our bystanders. And those are going to be removed from the game and the rest can be mixed up. And then we're going to draw three of these and we're going to place them in the building in locations. The rest can be restacked up and put off to the side for later use in this game. So let's go ahead and start with our, our ones. So we have a one, two, so all the way up there. And again, if you happen to roll on a fire space, you would simply just re-roll and place them on the next space. Then from there, then each player is also is going to choose and take a specialist, or you can randomly deal them out however you want to do it. So I'm going to set up for a three-player game. So we're going to go ahead and use red, white, and blue as our firefighters. And we are going to go ahead and take a captain, a driver, and a generalist. Next, based on the difficulty of the game and the number of firefighters that we're taking, we're going to place additional hotspots now. So since we're playing a recruit, we're not adding any additional hotspots for that. And we're going to add two additional hotspots if we're playing with three firefighters or three additional hotspots if we're playing with four. So as we're playing with three, we're going to go ahead and add two additional hotspots. So we have one, seven as a hot spot and six two. All right, and then we'll add the six additional hot spots that we'll use later on in the game to our grid up top here. Then each player is going to choose anywhere on the outside perimeter to place their firefighters. 
Then the players are going to decide where they want to place the ambulance and fire truck. So obviously our fire truck, we want to go down here so that uh, our driver can use it. And we have two points of interest, so we want to have our ambulance close to that. So we'll put it down here as well. From there, then we're going to go ahead and choose our first player. So we're going to go ahead and have the driver be the first player. And then we're ready to start the game. Flashpoint is played over an undefined number of rounds. During each round, it is going to proceed in a clockwise manner around the table, with each player getting to activate their character. During each player's turn, it's going to consist of three phases. Take action, advance fire, and replenish POI markers. This is going to continue until one of three different conditions are met, which are that the firefighter is able to rescue seven or more victims, or four or more victims are killed in the fire, or the building is destroyed by having all of the black markers out on the table and no more to be placed. So during a player's turn, like I said, there's three different phases, which are to take action, advance fire, and replenish POI markers. So I'm going to take you guys through each one of these in more depth now. So let's go ahead and start with the take action part of the player's turn. So during this phase, the specialist that the player is will dictate how many action points that player has to spend. From there, that player can spend those action points to do different actions. Each action that they choose to do can be done multiple times. And any unspent AP can be saved from turn to turn up to a maximum of 4 AP, which you'll use your action point markers for that. Now, you cannot save any free action points that you receive from your specialists. So the actions to choose from are to move, open closed door, extinguish, chop, drive, fire the deck gun, and crew change. So we're going to take a closer look at each one of these now. The first action we're going to look at is a movement action. In order to do movement action, you can move your firefighter to any adjacent space in orthogonal direction. There is no diagonal movement allowed in this, so it's an up, down, left, or right. And based on the space you move into is the number of action points you will have to spend in order to do that. If you're moving into an empty space or a space without fire, it's going to cost you one action point. If you want to move into a space with fire, it's going to cost you two action points. And if you are moving with a uh, survivor or a uh, victim, it's going to cost you two action points to move with that victim. Now, anytime you move into a space with a POI token, you're going to go ahead and reveal it. If it is a blank token or a false alarm, you're going to remove that and place it into the rescued section of your board. Otherwise, you must take the victim and get them out of the, the house. Now you can move through spaces that are, have destroyed walls, and you can move through spaces that have fire. Like I said, it costs two action points, but you must end your move on a, on a space that does not have fire. A firefighter can spend one action point to open or close a door. A firefighter can perform an extinguish action, either on his space or an orthogonally adjacent space that contains either smoke or fire. If he wants to extinguish smoke, it's going to cost him one action point. And if he wants to extinguish a fire, it's going to cost him two action points. Or he can choose to spend one action point to change fire to smoke. A firefighter can also choose to do a chop action on a wall segment that is in their space by spending two action points. The first time they spend two action points, they'll place one cube, and when the second cube is placed and that wall is destroyed, and both firefighters and fire can pass through those wall sections. One thing to keep in mind, though, is when you run out of those black cubes, the building is going to collapse, killing everybody in it. So that is one of the endgame conditions. You want to be careful on how many walls you chop, as it will also speed up the endgame condition for that. The drive action costs two action points, and you can use it either on the engine or the ambulance, if in the same space as that. Now, a firefighter can use a radio to move the ambulance, Vehicles can move in clockwise or counterclockwise directions around the, build, uh, the building. And vehicles must always start and stop in their parking spots. So for the ambulance, it's going to be the blue sections. And for the engine, it will be the yellow sections. Other firefighters in the vehicle's parking spot when being driven can ride for free. And if an ambulance is driven to a parking spot with a victim, that victim is going to be rescued at no action points. 
So let's go ahead and look at an example of this. We have our blue firefighter down here who can choose to move the ambulance to another section that is either clockwise or counterclockwise. So if he moves here for his two action points, our red fighter fighter could jump in and ride for free to the next spot, or we could come back down here if we chose as well. And this is important as with the advanced mode, you must get our victims into the ambulance. So you must drive the ambulance around. Now, if, for example, our red guy over there, let's say our red guy had a victim out here, he could choose to call the ambulance with his radio and move it with nobody in it. And once the ambulance got there, then he would move his victim to the rescued space. Another action players can perform is firing the deck gun. This is going to cost four action points unless the player is playing the driver operator. And the player that's using the deck gun must be in the engine and must be in the space or in the engine space of the quadrant that they wish to fire into as each quadrant is outlined by these red lines and will have its own engine space in order to, to fire into that quadrant. Now there also cannot be any firefighters in the quadrant that the player wishes to fire into. From there, then the player is going to roll both dice to get the coordinates of where the deck gun's going to hit. And if the coordinates are not in the quadrant that the player is in, then they're going to flip those over. So the four is, we have the four here, and then we're going to flip the two over because it's not in that space. So it's going to be four or five that the player is going to target. From there, then it's going to extinguish any fire that it hits, and then it's going to splash over to all of the orthogonal spaces and extinguish all those fire or smoke in those spaces. Now, if there was a door or wall, it is going to stop that effect, but this door is open, so it will extinguish that as well. A player that starts their turn on the engine can also choose to do a crew change action as their first action that turn. This is going to cost two action points and will allow them to swipe out their existing specialist with any specialist currently not in play. From there, then they can proceed with their turn as normal, minus the two action points that they've spent using any of the new specialist abilities that they want. Now that I've taken you guys through all the different actions, we're going to go ahead and say that the player has spent all of his actions during his turn. The next step in his turn is to advance a fire, so he's going to roll both fire dice to determine the coordinates of where he's going to place the smoke marker this turn. So we have a 4-5, so it's going to be here. So our smoke icon will be placed there. Now this is going to have different effects based on if there are other things there. So if smoke is placed in an existing smoke, then you're going to flip it over and it'll become fire. So if there was a smoke icon there already and we place another one, this would become fire. Then if a smoke is placed adjacent to a fire, you're going to flip it over. So if we would have ended up placing it up here instead, this would become fire because it is adjacent to fire tokens. And if smoke is placed on an existing fire, then you're going to resolve an explosion. So if we would have rolled one of these places that already has fire, then an explosion would be triggered and we would have to resolve that. So after resolving any effects from placing the smoke icon, if the space that you rolled on is a hotspot space, which is the little black flame token up there, then you're going to have to resolve another advanced fire roll. Now there are no limitations to the number of advanced fire rolls you can perform during a turn. So if you continue rolling spaces that have spot hot spots, you'll continue rolling. And then the last space that you roll, so let's go ahead and say, for example, we rolled this one next. We would again place smoke over there. And then you would also place a new hotspot token on that space. Now only one hotspot is added in a turn. And if no hotspot markers remain, then you will not add a new one. Hotspots have no effect on smoke or fire tokens, and hotspots are never removed from the board. The next fire effect we're going to look at is an explosion. So for this example, we're going to go ahead and say that we rolled the coordinates for this space here, which when you roll the coordinates of a space that already contains fire, it's going to cause an explosion. An explosion is going to radiate fire off in the four cardinal directions, and each space that doesn't have fire will be, have a fire token placed on it in those directions. If it is against a wall, then you're going to add a destruction token to the wall. And if a wall contains two destruction tokens, it is destroyed. If a space borders a door, then the door is also going to be destroyed and removed. And then the last thing is, say, for example, that when we place a, a uh, 
if we rolled this space, if this space already had fire, then you would cause a shock wave, which is going to radiate fire continuing down the path until there is either an open space, a wall, or a door in its way. If there's an open space, you'll place a, another flame token in that space. A wall or door will obviously will be removed or a, another damage token will be placed there. And this will happen in any of the directions. So if we rolled this again, it would shockwave out this way, down this way, igniting this, and again down this way, which would again cause damage to that wall and would also destroy that door. The last effect of the advanced fire phase is the flashover, which at the end of the phase you're going to go through and flip over any smoke marker to fire that is adjacent to a fire token. Any firefighters in a space with fire are knocked down, and any victims or POIs in a space with fire are lost. Place the token in the lost space. Remove any fire markers that are outside of the building. So in this our previous example, when we talked about the explosion and uh, shockwave, we did have a smoke uh, uh, icon down here now that is adjacent to fire. So this is now going to become fire as well. Now we don't have any fire tokens outside of the building. And none of our firefighters were in a space that contains fire now. And none of our POI uh, or victims are in those spaces. So then we're ready to move into the last part of the turn. When a fire advances into a firefighter space, they're going to be knocked down. So let's go ahead and look at an example of this. We're going to go ahead and say that our firefighter here was in this space. And at the end of the turn, if you guys remember, this was flipped over to a fire icon, so it would trigger a knockdown. When a knockdown happens, you're going to take the firefighter from its space and place it in the closest ambulance parking spot outside of the building, which happens to be this one. If carrying a victim, they are lost. A knockdown firefighter needs to go to the ambulance to recover. So in this situation, we were, been, we were fortunate enough to have the ambulance there ready. From there, then the firefighter can proceed as normal during his next turn. Hazmat is an improperly stored flammable material that is liable to cause an explosion. Any hazmat in a space with fire causes an explosion, and you'll resolve those effects if that happens. After resolving an explosion, remove the hazmat marker and add a hot spot to that space as well. Hazmat can be carried for two action points, and you can only carry one at a time. Hazmat carried outside of a building will be disposed of. The last phase in a player's turn is to replenish POI markers. Before ending your turn, replenish all lost, rescued, and false alarms. There should always be three POI markers on the board at the end of every turn. To do this, you're going to roll the coordinate dice as usual and place a new marker there. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that our firefighter was able to rescue that victim. At the end of his turn, he's going to roll the dice and place a new POI marker in that space. Now, the space can only, a POI marker can only be placed in a space without smoke or fire token, a firefighter, or another POI marker. So if a space already has one of those things, then you're going to follow the arrows that are on the board itself or on the diagram, as you guys can see here, until you find an open spot to place that marker. Players are going to continue taking turns until one of the end game conditions is met, which the players will end the game in victory if they're able to, to rescue seven or more victims from the building, and the game will end in defeat if four or more victims are lost or the building collapses by having all 24 damage markers placed in the building. Well, I hope you guys found this video helpful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. And if you enjoy this video, if you like what I do, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel, as it will help me to continue to grow and bring new and exciting games to you guys. And as always, thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch my videos and to leave me feedback on them. You can also reach out to me through my Facebook and Twitter accounts. Let me know what you guys are playing or what you're interested in. And... Until next time, I will see you guys later.